but if there's just one case, I feel that it's important that the community is told because I think that in our little community, we have only 15, well, 1900 people. And that's a small group of people, but there's one case in the school. I feel that most of the community would like to know if that is the case or not and why we wouldn't tell them. So, so if, if we have one case, the superintendent sends a letter uh -huh. to the parents. Right. It's, if there are five cases, the superintendent sends right. a letter to the parents. So it's not the number that letter is is distributed to our school parent family community. It's not posted on the website. Can Kirsten see us that way? She can see this way. Hi, Kirsten. <laughs> It's going to get us. <laughs> yep, no, I can hear you guys. Um, so I think when you just your question really quickly, um, it's, it doesn't have to be an outbreak. <clears throat> I'll send the letter. Right, right. You and I talked about does that letter go to the town health? And I said no. So my letter is going to the school. Beyond that, out of my hand, right? No, so anybody, because I just felt like that our, our health officer is a municipal officer, you know, who's part of the town as is our school department. And I think it's only because it's courtesy, but it's also more um, official if she's told if we have a case, just like anything like that. And I just think it's important. I don't know why we wouldn't. So if we're still doing that, then she's, she's on that. And just, I, you know, it, when it doesn't work the other way, so there could be a hundred cases in the community, but it's not the responsibility of the town to let the school know unless it is a school. Person. So in other words, she could find out if she looks it up. Oh, mm -hmm. no. Totally. I'm sure she must check that CDC website. Right. Yeah, right. And so that does help. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the information so, will be there. Okay. Because um, I just feel like it's important to be transparent in our town. So people, we all know what's going on. So that, that's how we stop rumors and misinformation. So I just think it's important to be there. I'm waiting for Andrew to get people for first thing. Uh, He's coming. <laughs> the first thing is what we really quiet about. There is against the wall. That's over there. Sorry, I was muted. I can hear you guys. Um, oh, now the video is moving again. Oh, all right. I don't need you to go to TV. That again, Kirsten? I can hear you guys. Um, it, your voices are a little muffled. Of course, 
so you'll just need to speak up so the microphone can pick up um, what you're actually saying. Okay, say something again before I test the audio. Okay. I, I can hear what you guys are saying. It's just a bit muffled. Because we're wearing masks here. <laughs> no, I know. I'm just saying you need to speak up a little bit so that as, as somebody's watching the video, I can tell you I'm not catching everything. Okay, you should be all set. Okay, thank you. We're calling the meeting to order. Let's do the pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And we are to the minutes of the August meeting. Do I hear a motion to accept the minutes? <laughs> okay, I'll make a motion to accept the minutes for the, for the uh, August meeting. Okay, is there a second? Thank you. Thank you. Any discussion? Okay, the last item which uh, I was quoted for is uh, page five, the opening plan on a monthly basis. And after thinking about it, uh, I think the opening plan should be uh, more or less reviewed when appropriate. We don't want to change the metal language there, but uh, as events change. So on a regular it basis, on a regular basis. So change it from a monthly basis to a regular basis. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Joe. Did anybody have anything else in the minutes that needed revision? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Pam motion. Thank you. I would entertain a motion to adopt the minutes as revised. So, so move. Second it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, all in favor? Yes. Okay. okay. All right, so public comments on agenda items. We do not have anybody who signed up. Okay. Uh, we, we move on to the principal's report. You're up, Kirsten. All right, so um, let's see. We did our first round of pool testing on the 20th. It went pretty smoothly. Uh, we ironed out some procedural efficiency details. We'll get even more efficient as time goes by. Um, unfortunately, due to, to some technical issues with uploading information to Concentric, our samples were not processed. So our first official round of pool testing took place yesterday. We have at least 30% of the students in each classroom participating. And we have received the results on five out of seven pool samples so far that were sent in, and they are all negative, which we are very thankful for. We did have a couple of positive cases on one of our school buses related to an outbreak at the high school. Thankfully, due to the most recent federal bus safety guidelines, pool testing, and some of the older students being able to be vaccinated, we did not have to quarantine the entire bus. We still have open positions. Houston, hold on. Okay. Um, so Kirsten just shared that Lake Region had a number of positive uh, COVID cases. Yeah. Uh, two of those were Sebago students 
Um, they did not have close contacts at the elementary school. Nope. And Lake Region handled it by going fully remote one day and then uh, identify close contacts, quarantine or remote. Correct. Sorry, Kirsten. That's okay. All right. Just gotta get back to my notes. Um, let's see. Um, we still have some open positions. We are still looking for a long-term sub pre-K ed tech, which starts October 25th. That'll be um, five days a week. We have a special ed um, teacher position open, which will be starting uh, November 1st through the end of the year, which is two days per week. And we still need a bus driver and we are offering a $1,500 sign-on bonus in case you know of anybody. Um, Ron Hanscom, who was our spare driver and almost full-time van driver has committed to being our regular bus driver for the remainder of the year. However, this means that if he or Michelle, our other bus lead bus driver, is ever out for any reason, we do not have a spare driver. And no, I am not getting my license. This would mean an entire bus route would most likely require the parents of middle and high school students to transport their children for the amount of time that Ron or Michelle is out and parents of elementary students would switch to 100% remote learning. We've reached out to our connections, but haven't had much luck yet. On the 16th, I attended a virtual conference put on by Drummond. Here's a hold on one sec. I'm gonna repeat the bus thing. Excuse me, I didn't hear. Yep. Any of it. I got it. So Kirsten just said that we, um, we have a couple of positions still open. Um, I'm going to revisit that in my report, so we'll hear that. Uh, we have filled the bus driver position with our substitute bus driver. Oh. So we have two and only two bus drivers. We have two buses and two bus runs for transporting our 6 to 12 students and our pre-K to 5 students. One driver cannot work on a day. The only backup plan we have is that the six to 12 students have to get themselves to school and the pre-K five students will have a remote day. We have no backup. We've called surrounding districts. Kirsten reached out to every surrounding district. We've reached out to private contractors. And we've been looking since the end of school last year for somebody with a license. It's a guy the boss and wants to. So that, that's what Kirsten just shared. So, in other words, if it's remote from K through five, one has the middle school and high school have to be on the phone. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll try again to say a little more. Um, let's see, um, remote learning packets have been sent home to cover our students in case we call a snow day in advance, in advance of a storm or for the first, few, uh, first two days should we have to switch to remote learning, which allows our teachers time to gather and prepare current materials. As for snow days, this year will be a little different. If we know a storm is coming and we have time to prepare bag lunches to send home with the students, the following day will be considered a snow day. If we can't send home meals, it can't be a snow day. A remote learning day has to be a snow day. If we do call a snow day, we'll make it up at the end of the year. And uh, one last piece that I have is we just received word that going forward, not just for this year, all students will be able to get free breakfast and lunches at school. We have definitely noticed an increase in our numbers. We are averaging about 50% of the students getting breakfast and 75% are getting lunches. Those numbers are up from an average of 30% for breakfast and 55% for lunches. And that's all I have. And I don't know what you heard, but I hope it was. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to work from Kirsten's notes, which she efficiently sent as she was speaking. <laughs> um, so after 
our bus update. Kirsten shared that she has attended from and Woodson workshop that looks at the policy rule um, workshop in October and take action on around um, seclusion and restraint. Kirsten shared that teachers have sent home remote learning packets in case we need to close school for a day. And we are hoping, thank you, Chris. We are hoping that we can meet the requirement of getting our students food on remote or snow days so that we count them as days of learning. So Kirsten and Morgan, our food service director, and myself are working to make sure we have a plan in place in case we close the school for any reason. We don't lose student learning. And we just got word that in addition to universal free lunch, we now have universal free breakfast. So our students are able to access food, breakfast, and lunch at no cost to parents. And then um, I'm just adding to Kirsten, we also have reached out, we, a member of the Rotary Club made a very generous offer to cover milk this year. Milk is already covered for free. So we are reaching out to see maybe we've got some, some families who have a balance in the lunch program and we're working to figure out how we can get some funds to cover that. Um, so, yeah. All right, that's Kirsten's report. Thank you, Kirsten. Okay, um, there is no chairwoman's report. Superintendent's report. Thank you. Um, included in your packet is an update from Main School Management Association. I include drafts of resolutions that MSMA will be voting on at their annual meeting and conference information in case any of you want to attend. If you have questions, you can ask me and I'll just answer. I'm giving an update on water quality. Um, starting last year, the school was um, under state guidance due to high levels of copper or copper levels outside the, the acceptable levels. Um, we contracted with a, um, a organization that put in a filtration system for us. We're confident that that will get the copper levels and the pH under control. However, when they installed it, um, we had a water test come back that showed some bacteria outside the acceptable levels. We were under a boil water order for about a week and a half. All of that's behind us now. Um, I can assure you that the water filtration system is going to come in as part of the budget. So we're going to be okay with that. And that what we have in place in future tests will show that we are drinking water within acceptable state level. Yes. Do we, do we have the filter on the right side of the plate now? <laughs> Just <laughs> <laughs> wasn't that our problem? I, I have the utmost confidence the filter was installed okay. in the correct place. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Always ask that <laughs> central question. <laughs> um, I've approved the leave request from Jordana Reese, our pre-K teacher. She is pregnant and hopefully on her way to having a healthy, happy baby. Um, she's requested a leave, unpaid leave for the remainder of the year after her maternity family leave runs out. Um, Ashley Russo, our, Alan, I'm going to mail it to you this time, I've got it. Um, Ashley Russo, the ed tech in that classroom will assume the teaching position, which is great. She knows the kids, she knows the family, she knows the program. Kirsten mentioned in her report that we have not yet 
and somebody to take the place of Ashley for the med tech. We continue to advertise and recruit. We're hopeful that we have somebody in place. If we do not have somebody in place, we will have to alter the program until we have somebody in place. So, so that looks like reduced time, either half days for half the kids or alternating days for half the students. It is not ideal. We are under strict state requirements to have no more than one, uh, no less than one adult for every seven pre k students. So we physically can't run the program with only one of them. If that happens, we'll come to the board because that actually is a change in the school, the committee approved calendar. So we will bring something forward in the October meeting if we need to act on that. Hopefully we don't. How long do we have? Yeah. How long do we have, David? So, end of October. Okay. You know how those things are. End of October. <laughs> I'll continue to update you on in my regular board updates. So, I'm also going to share another staffing change, and this one I've never seen before. So I accepted the resignation of Kate Sterling, who was in addition to director of special education, filling in for two days a week as a special education teacher, a position that we had open all summer and couldn't fill. Kate, Kate's unable to do that position well and maintain a sane life. So I'm telling you, that I've accepted the resignation of somebody that you are going to vote to hire later in the year. Okay. It's strange, <laughs> but I think it's right. We've advertised, we've recruited. Kirsten is, is doing a really good job creating possibilities. We hope that soon we'll have somebody to step in before the end of the month when Kate um, stops doing that role. And um, our operations committee met today and we've begun work on developing a multi-year facilities and maintenance plan. We'll have that prepared in time for the FY23 budget. Um, and I will keep the board, the, the committee informed as we go forward with that. Um, Welcome. You know, I'm saying this in public. Um, we invited, we needed a parent because of, we had a parent step off the board when they moved out of town. We invited Joe Williams. Um, anything we can do to keep him as a member of that committee is what I'll do. <laughs> it went really well today. So, so incredible amount of knowledge and experience around the table um, in a place where where I have limited. So. I'm personally very appreciative. That is the floor of the superintendent. Mm -hmm. And Alan, I'm going to press send right now. Okay. And Kristen, you're going to do the same. Uh, yeah, Kristen, you did? Yes. Thank you. I already did it. Great. <laughs> okay, we are on action items. So let's start with A. The second read on the remote participation in school board meetings policy DEP. Okay, so we need a motion to accept the policy. Okay, and a second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? We now need someone to propose to accept with the revisions discussed at the workshop. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe the superintendent can give a little background on that. Okay. So this is a policy that is brand new for districts around the state. It comes after the state of emergency where many districts were remote and the ability to have discussion and take votes remotely 
was allowed under the emergency order. The emergency order is no longer in effect. So for the school department to allow an individual member or all of us to meet remotely, we need to have this policy in place. Um, there was a discussion in the workshop prior to the meeting about what situations might be appropriate for an individual board member to be remote. And the sense of the committee was that at the discretion of the chair was what we were comfortable with, as opposed to identifying three or four or five specific types of situations. So the revisions to this policy would be in the first part attendance, and they would leave A in place, strike B, C, and D, and replace that with what's currently E. And it would say special circumstances at the discretion of the chair. So that is the revision coming out of the workshop. So, does anybody want to? I'll make a motion to protect the remote participation in school board meeting for the Okay. Thank you. All those in favor? <clears throat> okay, so are we doing first reads on the next one? Um, we are doing first reads. Yeah. We're doing we're doing B yeah. as is. Yeah. Okay. So B, we have the policy and the procedure. Uh, first read. Use of physical restraint and seclusion policy JKAA and procedures on physical restraint and seclusion uh, JKAA R. So, do I have a motion to accept those as first reads? And seconded. Thank you. Any discussion on those policies at this time? Discussing them at our next meeting. Materials will come to you um, for workshop prior to the October 26th meeting. So we'll have an opportunity to go into mm -hmm. them in detail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. who, who did the crossing out of all this, this stuff that's down here? Did we do that in the beginning? Is that how um, Kathy it? did based oh. on. Um, the template from MSMA. Okay. Okay. Cool. So instead of including our current policy and the recommended policy, she took our current policy and made the recommended changes. Okay. And that's what you have in your packet. We'll provide additional information prior to the workshop. We did have a first and second reading for the different version. It's according to this. Right. We, have, we have this policy in place. Right. Yeah. But there's a new state law that okay. requires us to change. I'm sorry, I should have said that. Okay. There's a new state law that requires us to revisit our um, restraint and seclusion policy. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the most recent version of it in your packet. Okay. okay. Thanks. Sorry about that. So, is there any more discussion on those? Seeing none, all in favor to accept them as a first read? Okay. See, job descriptions, first three. We did not get to number one. Yeah, we can accept it as a first read if we want and workshop it in October. Okay. 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 Yeah. So, so I'll need a motion to accept. We can do them together, the principal and the director of special services um, job descriptions. Oh. As, as first reads. Okay, so thank, you. thank you, Joe. Second. <laughs> so thank you, Tina. Any discussion on those at this time? Seeing none, all in favor? Uh, 
Okay. Now we are down to B personnel. Number number one. Would you like me to speak to these? Yes, I would. <laughs> <laughs> so so Kate Sterling is currently our special ed director, director of special services. Um, we had a long time opening for a part-time special education teacher. We were unable to find anybody to apply. Kate applied, um, we created a full-time position for her, adding these two days. And after um, a period of time, we were just unable to continue with those extra two days. So. We still have hired her, we paid her, and we'll pay her at the end of October. So the board needs to approve that. Um, Liz Cannell agreed to step in to fill another long term vacancy. We were looking for an ed tech to support our students in special education all summer and into the fall, unable to find one. Liz Cannell, who teaches health and PE for us, agreed to pick up the extra time. So she's now with us full time in two positions. Um, we are we are overjoyed. Overjoyed is a good word. And then um, we had a resignation short notice for our easy custodian, um, Dave Brown, our our head custodian, found somebody in the community to apply. Bill's um, Bill C card has been working with us now for a couple of weeks. We are incredibly happy with his work. The school is looking good. Um, he brings a positive attitude and we're glad he's on board. Okay, so I think we can do these as a group. Mm -hmm. so, as a block. So do I hear a motion to accept um, one, two, and B, one, two, and three? Okay, I second. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Yep. Okay. So now we're down to E, emergency management plan. So the emergency management plan is reviewed annually by the school committee. Um, we are, we reviewed it. Uh, Kirsten is the building administrator. Make sure that we are current and updated in all of our emergency management requirements. We shared with you the plan electronically. And we would ask that the board approve it as is and hope we never have to use it. Okay. So, I need a motion to accept the emergency management plan. Okay. I'm a second. This. Okay. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Okay. Now 10F, the reopening plan. So I can share some current information, Kirsten, if you're um hearing and i'm missing anything um please feel free so we are through our first month of school um we feel that the precautions we have in place have allowed us to be in person all students all month um we are reporting on staff vaccination rates. Our September state report is that 72.7% of our staff is fully vaccinated. We are um, pool testing our students as Kirsten shared. We've done our first round and what we got back today showed no positive cases in the pool testing. We are in communication with a number of families who are asking good questions about quarantining if a positive case happens in a classroom. As we currently work under the approved reopening plan, 
we are asking parents to provide daily assurance that the child doesn't have symptoms, the golden ticket. We are asking that all students, staff, and visitors in the school be masked. We ask that physical distance as appropriate to allow for in-person learning. We did not ask for physical distance in classrooms. We do have physical distance at lunch. So if a student tests positive for COVID-19 in a classroom, There will be students who are asked to quarantine at home because we cannot assure, we cannot ensure that students were not within three to six feet for 15 minutes of cumulative time. So we're, that whole class will have to go through the quarantine protocol. It, it's, as I shared previously, our school this year looks like school two years ago in the classrooms, except for the masks. And hopefully we'll clean better. So, I mean, those are the precautions we're taking. The results of the first month are the results of the first month. I think that's, that's important information for the board to consider going forward. Um, I'm not sure if I missed anything. Um, might be new information. Kirsten? Um, all I, uh, the vaccine rate that I reported was 77%. That was rounded. So um, the state may have gone down to the actual 10th of a percent. And while we are doing our best to uh, socially distance at lunch, we do have four kids to a table, but they are assigned seats. So they're not necessarily six feet apart, but we know who they are sitting with, so we can keep track of it that way. And they are sitting by class. I feel like I feel like I'm working at the United Nations. <laughs> <laughs> I believe I believe Kirsten said Please that that up for you. our staff percentage is higher. Alan got that off the State Department of Ed website, so it is what it is. Um, we are in the lunchroom. We've run two lunches to lower the number of students who are in there. So it's two grades at a time. Students are assigned seats, four to a table. We try to minimize okay. passing contact and time with the mask off to eating. Um, we hope that that has lowered potential exposure and limited contact tracing as we go forward. Yes. Lunch, mask, no, cleaning. Oh, I know what it was. How disruptive was the pool testing? I mean, did it take an inordinate amount of time? If, if, if the chair would allow, mm -hmm. I think Chris would be the best one to answer that. Um, oh, sorry to put you on spot, Chris. No, so to do... <clears throat> I would say to do the, the whole school, it's taking the baby about an hour, hour and a half each, each time it's getting that uh, faster because people know what, what's expected of them and they're not as squeamish to um, put the, the uh, swab in, in their nose. Um, so we kind of call out one grade at a time who has signed up to do pool testing. We do it in, in the hallway and then they go back in and we continue down the hallway with my the little cart. And um, then we process, this. well, they have a barcoder and we and the courier has been very timely at coming at noontime on Mondays to take the samples. But so far the kids have been very, cooperative. They don't seem to be, no one's tried, you know, they've hesitated, but they've all seemed to be 
you know, used to it. And also if the chair would allow, we have two classroom teachers who actually have also lived that. So if you want. No, it, it was fine. Um, I went out with pool testing with the kids too and, and did it and they were surprised. And you no, know, it was very efficient. Chris squirted hands with sanitizer and then you swabbed your nose and put it in the container and back in the room. So it was pretty quick for the number of children that were participating. Yeah, same same in my classroom. It was smooth. I'm, I was glad that you put them in the hall. I think that makes made the process a whole lot easier. Yeah. Um, so streamlined so far, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I think you know Chris alluded. Kirsten and Chris are working to streamline it as even get better each week. Mm -hmm. So it's learning for all of us. Trying to do it on a weekly basis. Yeah, we do. We do it on Mondays uh, before noon, and this week we got results back Tuesday. This afternoon, yeah. except for two classes. Except for ones we didn't. <laughs> but, but last week, last week the ones we did were all of them. So yeah. we're not the only ones learning. <clears throat> action on because this is something yeah so i think that you are continuing to adopt mm -hmm. or okay. revise okay the reopening plan so we need a motion again to yep. to adopt the revised um, language we already language. did that no nope, we already did that in the minutes in the minutes but so now this, this is oh if there's no change you don't need a motion there was a change i think Technically, Danelle, right? Mm -hmm. Even though we made a change to the reopening plan in the minutes, we should probably approve that it's revised okay. in the minutes. Okay. Good. And then open for discussion if people want to change. Okay. So I'm looking for a motion to adopt the revised language um, to revisit on a regular basis in our reopening plan. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Regina. Thank you, Joe. Any discussion on that? Okay, seeing none. All in favor? Okay. Items for future agenda. Nothing that wasn't outlined at the first read mm -hmm. that I I'm aware of. I'll look at the perpetual calendar to see if we need to add something. And okay. We'll address that in our plan. Did anybody have anything? To um, sometime this fall, vaccinations for younger children will be hopefully approved by FDA. I'm assuming that there will then be a plan on how the school would approach that or not. You know, so. I think that there are two separate pieces. There's a public health piece. If our school has run vaccination clinics before for flu, we would discuss that. If there's any type of impact for all students, then that becomes part of the reopening plan revisit. So, so maybe October, maybe November. Chris. So I know our. Our flu clinic with Northern Lights is scheduled for November 9th. So we'll see if anything is approved or or if Northern Lights will have any any I things they can add or something like that. But as of right now, it's just for the flu clinic on the ninth. It's like we always have. Like we always have. That's the public health part of what we do as a school. Is that for the staff or the kids? Both. Okay. Um, we are up to public comment on non agenda items. Hello to everyone. The August meeting, I asked whether critical race theory was part of our school curriculum. None of the board members seemed to 
have had much knowledge of what CRT is. Some even questioned whether I really knew what it was. <clears throat> so I would like to share with you some of what I know that truly concerns me. CRT is Marxism with race used instead of class in the struggle between <clears throat> the Marxist view of oppressors and oppressed for the, excuse me, for Marx, the middle class oppresses the workers. For the advocates of CRT, the white race, solely because of their race, are the oppressors, and all other races are the oppressed. In order to eliminate the scourge of whiteness, whites must take sensitivity training confess publicly their sin of whiteness and do penance. The sin of whiteness and the CRT agenda permeates our government. President Biden has instructed government agencies to implement CRT, particularly in education and our military. Our colleges and universities are teaching CRT to the exclusion of the importance of families, religion, property, the constitution, and any institution that impedes the growth of Marxist by government. Given this information, I would request that the board have a public review of our school's curriculum, textbooks, workbooks, and study aids <clears throat> to see if there are being infected with CRT. And thank you for your attention to this critical race theory. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Would the board mind if I read this? It's a little bit longer. Um, and I will give you each copy of it. I was going to say, how long is it? Is it just a page? Yes, yeah, that one page. That's fine. Yes. I'm a mother, grandmother, great grandmother, who was a teacher for 27 years. If there's anything my experiences have taught me about kids is that they deserve and need to know the truth. Yes, it has to be age appropriate, perhaps build out a bit if they a bit at a time if they're young, but we cannot lie to them or teach them half truths. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? It's a part of our longer statement that we're all we're aware of. And yet we have a rising force with our society that is advocating that some things cannot be taught or discussed in schools. If the whole truth cannot be discussed, but only some, is that not indoctrination? Critics of critical race theory say that any discussions of differences can be divisive. Anything that looks at how government policies may have led to discriminatory practices will make one group feel like the oppressed and one group feel like the oppressors. Any discussion of, any discussion of diversity training, slavery, LGTB clubs, sexism, and racially connected historical events will cause depression in some students. Most of these discussions are not likely to take place in a K-5 school like SES, but there are some 27 states that have introduced bills or taken steps banning or limiting how teachers can discuss racism. Critical race theory came from legal studies done 40 years ago at the college level, looking at how racism has shaped public policy, but it's now become a hot topic in education and threatens to deny our children the whole truth surrounding our shared history. It has evolved into attributing CRT as the cause of Black Lives Matter protests and advocating discrimination against white people. There are still countries where the government dictates what should be taught and even believed. China, for instance, has about 380 re-education camps where minorities are detained. Are we going to resort to only letting our children learn what's dictated? India still has a strong caste system preventing individuals from rising beyond the caste into which they're born. Are we going to suggest that any minorities in our country are to remain in place? Germany is well known for the horrific atrocities that its ruling government sponsored. Yet then try, rather than try to cover them up, ban discussion of or education about that past, they not only acknowledge that it happened, but they teach it. The camps are on display, so the past is not forgotten nor repeated. The names of those who were killed are engraved on pavers placed in front of where they live. We forcibly moved Japanese citizens in the U.S. to internment camps during World War II, taking their lands, homes, and businesses. Mm -hmm. 
We removed Native Americans from their land and to reservations, sending their children to schools where they were forbidden to speak their own language and were often badly mistreated. We enslaved thousands of Blacks over decades, dividing families and treating them in un unimaginable ways. We continued to deny them equality with laws against which school they could attend, who could marry, and which neighborhoods could receive mortgages. Should all these events be deleted from our kids' social study books? Should any similar discussions be banned? Or do we teach of past ills so they are not repeated? Who do we want to be? I am very, very concerned for the direction some would have us go. I've read of the discussions with former Governor LePage concerning the direction and future of education in Maine. Please remember the quote, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. George Santayana. Thank you, Claudia. So, So uh, <clears throat> about a month ago, if somebody asked me what CRT was, I would have said it's a cathode ray tube, but most of us knew those as TVs <laughs> until recently with the flat screen. Well, I did some reading as well, <clears throat> and I had to read some of the stuff I read more than once to get a grasp on what it was and what the intent was of groups that now want to use it. I got one very short thought <clears throat> that I hope everybody can uh, learn with, live with, and teach with. And that is, we need to learn from our mistakes of our past. We all made them. Our culture has made them. And I don't know anybody that hasn't made some. And those that are quick learners and learn not to do a certain behavior uh, after a short while are the winners. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, I have great faith and trust in the system that you guys are creating and, and perpetuating by your participation. I appreciate your time and I'm confident you'll make the right decision. And that is we need to learn from our mistakes. Our kids need to learn what is a mistake, not hide the past mistakes of our cultures and learn from that and teach a future that we can all be proud of. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Okay, we're up to information items, future meetings. Um, next month, we have our workshop on October 26th at 5.30 and our regular meeting on October 26th at 6.30. Anybody else that would like that? You want, to, you want to announce November and December while well, we're on the topic? Um, if we remember, one, November 16th and December 14th. Thank you. November. November 16th. So, no Thanksgiving meeting. December, December 14th. No Christmas meeting. Right. And we'll do the same 5 30 workshop, 6 30 meeting. And we'll put that on the agenda for next time. Thank you, Alan, Please. for keeping me on track there. Someone's going to do it or not. Is it possible to have a workshop in the conference room? Like it says here. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it's ready. Um, that's what we used to do. Yeah. I, I prefer it only because then we can finish up our business before. So the superintendent will try to end the meeting going on in the conference room prior to the workshop beginning, which he failed to do. It's the operations committee chair. That's the problem. That's all I'm saying. I don't know. Don't tell him I said that. Okay. And I would entertain a motion to go into executive session. Good night, thank you. <clears throat> and the second motion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Y